Greetings and welcome to Your Place on the River, a podcast brought to you by Carriage Kia of Woodstock, Georgia, featuring Chattahoochee Nature Center. I'm your host, Larry Stevens, a naturalist and bon vivant here at the Chattahoochee Nature Center, where our mission is to connect people with nature. The CNC is a private, nonprofit 501c3 organization supported by our members and community at large like you. To learn more about Chattahoochee Nature Center, visit chatnaturecenter.org. That's C-H-A-T-T naturecenter.org. Today, we'll meet our horticulture department manager, hear about the impact of pollution on the Chattahoochee River, and learn about an important Georgia keystone species. Hey, who's that outside there? Larry! Hi, Larry! Ah, it's my favorite field guide, the CNC's very own Scott Tracy. Where do we find you today on CNC's 127-acre campus, Scott? And what are you up to? We're going forest bathing! Oh, that's my favorite thing to do. Let me come and join you after I introduce our first segment. So let's visit with Jacqueline McRae and find out what all her duties as the CNC Horticultural Manager entail. Hello everyone, Liam again. And like Larry said, with us today we have Jacqueline McRae. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Of course, we're really excited to have you on the podcast. Just to set the tone for this interview, why don't you walk us through your average day in the horticulture department on the property? All right, will do. And that's really a good question. You use the word average because each day is very, very different. We never know quite what to expect. We start our days by walking the grounds or riding the grounds, armed with brooms and at least one set of clippers so that we can tidy up as we go along the paths that the public are going to be walking on when the Nature Centre opens. You know, we want people to get up close with our plants, um, but we want them to be safe too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we heard a little bit of what you said your daily duties in the property are. What about when you're off property? Because even when you're not around the nature center, plants don't stop planting. Uh, This is true, and this is actually the reason why we bring the brooms with us in the morning, because there's been a lot of foraging overnight, and we often find the chips and the bits of soil in the pathways. You know, we'll find footprints, so we have some clues about who's been here. And every once in a while, we'll come across a herd. And I use the word herd because I think now we're up to at least seven deer in the herd that's currently on the property. Literally standing in our flower beds, though, and not really thinking about moving. So, <laughs> um, Just before Christmas, we were really surprised to find one of our trees had actually been cut down by a wild beaver. So that, you know, gave us plenty to talk about. And um, yes, that's what happens when we're not here, when we're not looking. (laughs) The work never stops. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Last time we talked, we talked a lot about native plants and planting native. Why is it so important to plant native plants around the nature center? Oh, that's a really, really big question. But essentially, you know, we're a nature center and we're in Georgia and all the nature that's here that we enjoy, the butterflies, the insects, the birds, the small mammals, they can all only be here because of the plants that are growing. So, you know, the plants are attractive with their flowers. I mean, we humans think so, but certainly the pollinators and the insects do too. Um, And the plants make nectar and pollen, brings the insects. The birds see the insects and they want to eat the insects. And then these same native plants, they're really timed to work together with our nature. And they're able to feed our Georgia wildlife in the wintertime too. It's almost like working in tandem with the uh, uh, other wildlife around. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, there are myriad relationships, but that's just, you know, really touching on the basics. Um, And thinking about the butterflies, you know, we want to have butterflies here. But if you want butterflies, you have to make butterflies. And we make butterflies with caterpillars. And the caterpillars are eating the leaves of those native plants that we've been putting in. Not sure if you remember me telling you about this, but there is a professor who's spent time studying and actually counting the number of insects that parenting birds will feed to their young to raise a clutch of chickadees, for example. And his students on average counted that it took between six and 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of baby birds, which is astounding. But that explains why we need the native plants and the leaves. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You need all of those caterpillars. Oh, we do. You said six to 9,000? Yes, it's oh incredible. Gosh. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of beautiful native plants around here at the Nature Center. You can walk down the paths and look around them, but you can also buy some of them here, right? That's a very good point, yes. We work year-round growing plants that we're going to be able to sell at our native plant sales. We have a big sale in the spring and one in the fall, and then a smaller sale during the butterfly encounter in the summertime, and one again in the winter as part of the symposium that takes place at the end of January. 
We grow these from seeds. We grow these from cuttings of plants that are in the garden. And we also sometimes pot up some of the things that we might have an excess of. But it's so important for everyone to try and be growing native plants. You know, even one native plant added to your garden, to your container garden, or to your community green space, it's going to make a difference for some wildlife somewhere in Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. Do the same thing that we're trying to do here uh, in your own home. That's awesome. Yes, everyone can do a little bit. Uh, how many plants are roughly sold for those native plant sales? Well, I've never been a good mathematician, but if my <laughs> math is correct, we sold close to 10,000 plants last year over the course of the year. And that would have included between two and 300 different varieties. You know, we understand that you know, not everybody can have a pollinator garden in full sun. Not everybody has a big space. So we're growing and selling, you know, grasses, ferns, shrubs, trees and flowers too. And we're thinking about, is this for dry, rocky soil or is this for a moist area? We've really tried to offer a broad selection for all sorts of different settings. Yeah, that's awesome. Of all those plants, do you have a favorite? <laughs> <laughs> we're not supposed to have favorites, but yes, I do. My, my favorite Georgia native plant is the bottle brush buckeye. The flowers just drop dead gorgeous, foot and a half tall spikes of white flowers that hummingbirds feed on and butterflies too. It just comes alive in the summer with insects. Yes, that's my favorite. Oh, that's gorgeous. And you can see the work and the effort put into the plants here around the Nature Center. But a lot of your like ground troops are volunteers, right? This is true. We have three people on the core horticulture team and we're out there rain or shine, but we are so excited to be able to work with lots of volunteers. Um, we count the volunteers by how many hours they put in. Alone last year in the Unity Garden, which we'll talk about a little later, but that would be 3,000 hours of service just given to the Nature Centre to help with growing and planting. We have volunteers who come weekly we have a group we call them the fearless ground volunteers because they really don't mind what it is we're trying to take out clean up cut down drag which we do to clear the spaces and find the native plants that have maybe become smothered and overgrown so they come on wednesdays we have one among them his name is dan prucher i want to give him a shout out because he just he gets us outside when maybe members of the team are otherwise thinking <laughs> it might be a day to stay indoors because of the rain or because of the cold but he's literally unstoppable you may not know this but we i just talked about a lot of cleanup we don't put our clippings out at the street we do keep them here at the nature center we have a secret hiding place back up in the woods where the public don't go <laughs> but we do this because there may be insect ed cases or overwintering insects or you know some wildlife that should be here we so we want it we want to keep it here with us yeah absolutely um and also then master gardeners, the Cobb master gardeners help us out quite a lot. One of their projects is actually our butterfly garden. So they come every Monday in their weeding and, you know, t well, tidying as much as we would tidy a native plant garden, <laughs> but keeping it looking good. And part of why we do this is because during the summer, we use this garden to demonstrate this relationship between insects and flowers and participate in the great southeastern pollinator count. So it's part of a year-long cycle that they're investing their time and then we have the reward, you know, when 1,800 insects land, you know, and <laughs> we get sick. to count them, you know, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want to hear from Dan, just tune back into episode one. We mentioned, talked a lot about native plants. What are some plants that aren't native to Georgia that we have a lot of? And uh, how does that affect the ecosystem? So the management of land in an urban area today is always going to involve managing for invasive plants because they are taking over, hence the word invasive. They've become such a problem in Georgia in general that Georgia has set up the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Control Council to help us categorize and understand the plants that should not be here and then how best to remove them and taking it a step further to talk about what you can put in their place. So hundreds of thousands of acres have been lost. When, when you hear the term mm. habitat loss, it is lost to the these plants, these invasive plants that have taken over. So here specifically at the Nature Center, we have right now a problem, a tree that is evergreen when it shouldn't be. It is blocking out the sunlight from the forest floor. And with one tree, 
it's just nowhere near as useful as the many different species that could be growing in its place, which you know the different forms of wildlife, such as the caterpillars, are going to use. So we would far rather see more oaks, more beech, more hickory than the trees that have sneaked into our forest, for example, that we, you know, we're trying to take care of. So does that answer your question fully? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. I mean, I could see how one tree could affect like a, a dozen other uh, native plant species that could be growing where it is. We have a group of volunteers that meets once a month on Saturdays. They work on what we term habitat restoration, and that is what this is. It's restoring the habitat, restoring the forest floor, or even the watershed down by off the boardwalk to what it is supposed to be. And that group is committed 100% to removing these unwanted, which we are calling invasive plants. And they're led by our fearless volunteer, who's unofficially a fearless volunteer, but Larry Stevens. <laughs> All right. You mentioned these invasive plants. How did they get here in the first place? So the invasive plants, those are the ones we're describing um, that have typically come from other countries and they're happy to be here growing and spreading without any insects that are from here that actually want to eat them. They got here because people brought them here in response to demand for something different. So these plants are literally from other countries. English ivy is a good example. It's evergreen and people celebrate that, but it, it shouldn't be evergreen here. We don't want evergreen here. But mostly it's acts of humans planting them in their own gardens, and then it's acts of nature, such as birds eating the berries, flying a little ways and dropping them off. And that's how we find them randomly growing in our forests. You mentioned a unity garden. What can you tell me about that? Oh, okay. So of the 127 acres that we have here, one quarter acre is dedicated 100% to the growing of produce, vegetables, fruits and herbs. And it is all donated to the North Fulton County Charities Food Pantry. We plant seeds, we raise these plants. The volunteers help us get them out in the ground. During growing season, there's a lot of weeding to be done to keep, you know, to keep everything growing as best it can. Last year, we managed to produce over 9,500 pounds of produce, which is quite incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as impressive as that is, we're kind of proud because it wasn't just potatoes, right? We grew <laughs> over a hundred different kinds of things because you know it's so important that people can have choices and they can experience variety. And I'd like to give a shout out to the corporate volunteers too that come and help. This is um, corporations around Atlanta that may be wanting to do perhaps a day of giving back, but they will send groups of people out, maybe 20, 25, and they come and help us out for a few hours. Last year, 30 different corporations in the area sent people, which was quite an impressive number, and we got quite a lot done. Because we don't own an 18-blade tractor, you know, mm -hmm. all of those rows and furrows, they're dug by hand, so we appreciate an extra lift. Yeah, absolutely. We have a very specific geography here at the Nature Center. Our watershed is smack dab in the middle of Metro Atlanta. What role does the watershed play in the help or hindrance of native plants? It's a really good question because it's a big responsibility to be gardening, meaning working with plants in horticulture within a watershed. We take this responsibility very seriously and are very mindful about what plants we put in and very intentional about which plants we actually take out. So we feel really good that we're sending the American Beautyberry downstream rather than the privet that nobody wants <laughs> and connecting ourselves, this green space with other green spaces across Georgia by doing so. Awesome. And uh, we're running out of time here, but one more thing before we head out. Our mission statement, connecting people with nature is really important to us. In what ways can you say that the horticulture has uh, attributed to that? So, yeah, connecting people with nature and we're connecting them with nature via the plants. Mm -hmm. We want to inspire people to have these same plants at home. We want people to not just see the plants and say, oh, that is so pretty. We want them to really see the plants and see the functions that they have. So I would say I would hope that the people that come to the Nature Center and see these living plants are inspired and, and do want to repeat this where they can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do, the work that your team does, and thanks to our volunteers. But lastly, thank you for joining us today, Jacqueline. <laughs> thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Back to you, Larry. Thank you, Jacqueline and Liam. Now I'm out here with Scott. Thanks for having us join you out here in the woods today. Glad to have you, Larry. You're all welcome anytime. Of course, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., noon to five on Sundays. <laughs> yes, of course. So what are we gonna do today? 
Well, I figured we would just go out and do a little exploring here in our CNC woods. Sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah. First thing I like to do when I go out on a walk in the woods is think about this concept that I've heard one of my favorite philosophers talk about, Alan Watts, talks about the idea of purposelessness. Purposelessness? Yes, purposelessness. To come out on this walk and have nothing to gain from it except that you're here and in the woods and being part of the world turning. And absorbing. And absorbing. Yeah. Observe, I mean, observing and absorbing. <clears throat> absorbing. <clears throat> yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can just uh, not have any expectations, you'll be much more of a receptive being mm. and uh, you may notice a lot more. Yeah. You ever go on walks with people that are like, where, where do you think they're trying to get to? The end of the woods? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> know. They're so busy. Yeah. yeah. I like going out with my grandchildren because their eyes are brighter and they're more alert. And uh, so, and I can sort of dream off it. They'll, they'll spot things for me, and I appreciate that. And then we talk about it. Well, yeah. first thing I like to do is attune my five senses. Mm. Well, maybe not all five of them. Yeah, minus the taste. Yes. One time I had a school group, and we did that exercise with a cupping of your ears, and then they listened for 15 seconds. And there's one group that had a blind girl. And mm. her classmates were amazed how much more she was able to pick up listening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess kids kids are young, don't know about that uh, compensation of the senses yeah. quite yet. But I encourage them to also hone their sense of wonder and their sense of humor. Mm-hmm. 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 mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can't forget about those senses. <laughs> what do we got here? Some pulled apart. I don't know what that is. Is that scat? No, those look like seeds. And they're seeds, but they were, were they, where they pass through. And there's that, what you would call a box. Uh, what do you call that plant? With? Whenever I find something that I don't know a lot about here in the woods, uh, first thing I do is look up, see if maybe it fell. <laughs> Make sure it's not about to fall on me, perhaps. Yeah, you look up and you look around and you see if... Uh, See if you see any example of what you're seeing on the ground. In this case, I'm not. No. So that means something must have carried this on over here. And what makes this place so special for it to have eaten here. Mm-hmm. So it's not a magnolia uh, mm-hmm. pulled apart, you think? Those are a little orange, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, red or yeah. Because if you look around here on the, on the yellow trail, and we got big piles of magnolias that have been chopped down and then stacked up, yeah. um, which makes for nice habitats for wildlife, and bunny rabbits and birds and snakes. Absolutely. We were working on basic needs with a group of first graders, and of course we looked at pine cones, and of course pine cones just the squirrels and the chipmunks peel back the scales and get the little nuts down. To make their pesto. <laughs> to make their pesto. <laughs> You're a pesto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good one. Oh, there's some mushrooms here, too. I was listening to the BBC and, and from the Kew Botanical Garden, and he calls it fungi, not fungi. So. Yeah, you know, it's one of, those, uh, one of those things. Nobody's wrong. Nobody's right. You can call it whatever you want, I guess, as long as you're understood. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like fun to me, where you could be like such an authority on something and then you just call it by a totally different name. <laughs> what are they going to say? You don't know what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah Turtus like... migratorius. That's, that's the, the binomial for the American robin. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not very attractive, but... Uh, Tur- you said turtus? Tur- yeah, I said turtus. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know that. Learn something new every day. In fact, let's all learn something new now from Mark Giolanella, our education program supervisor. He's going to discuss with Liam the impact of pollution on our Chattahoochee River. Hello, everyone. Liam again. And today with me, I have Mark Giolanella. Hey, Mark. Hi, Liam. Today, we're going to be talking about the overall health of the river. 
I've heard a lot of stigmas about the health of the Chattahoochee River. Uh, if you'd like to talk about some of those. Well, you know, some people, you know, you hear sometimes they say, you know, the river is dirty, you know, it's polluted. They'll say things like that. But in reality, the river is cleaner than it's ever been before. So a lot of work has been done over the years to make the river a, a healthy and, and thriving river here in the state. Awesome. Uh, What kind of impacts to the river could be harmful to its health? Well, so what happens sometimes is uh, the major impacts that occur on on the river are the sedimentation. And sedimentation is when you have the dirt, the sediment washing into the river. And so that's what sometimes you have that brown color after like a big rainstorm. And what that's bringing with it is sometimes there can be high levels of bacteria that end up um, in the river called E. coli. And that's when sometimes you'll, you'll see where they'll say, like, you know, the bacteria level's high in the river, so it's not, you might want to not go on the river. And that's only for very short portions of time, because typically that, that happens more in the summertime. And uh, that can, you could get sick if you were to maybe ingest that water, but it is very low. And so we actually monitor that for our canoe trips. And what happens too is once it's sunny out, the sun, the UV rays is actually what kills off that, that E. coli bacteria. But that is one of the things. So if it is cloudy and dirty, it's a little harder for the sunlight to penetrate the water to kill that, that bacteria. Uh, but other things that happen are the runoff from impervious surfaces like parking lots and the major issue here is uh, the development in this area where you'll see hard surface parking lots things of that nature of roadways so sometimes oils and things like that can end up getting washed into the river um, over time through heavy storms but that's also um, one of the things that can happen and what happens then is it can end up impacting the wildlife so the sediment can become impactful to fish, which you need to breathe through their gills, right, to get the oxygen. Also, your freshwater crustaceans and uh, your bivalve crustaceans too, and mollusks, which are filter feeders. So they can end up with kind of like clogging up, so to speak, when they're trying to filter their food through with all that sediment. We talked about sewage, sedimentation, runoff. What other impacts could there be to the river's health? So one of the things that happens is fertilizers and pesticides can end up washing into the river. So, you know, you can manage, you know, what you're using on your lawn, different products like that. And what that that can cause sometimes are different sort of bacteria and sometimes even contribute to like like algae blooms and things of that nature. One thing that does happen that happens a lot on the river is people try to help the river out. So there's definitely ways that things are cleaned up. There's regulations that prevent building within a certain distance of the river shoreline. So that helps with that sediment washing into the river. So if there's a restriction on how close you can build to the river, less sediment can go into it. Doesn't wash into it, I guess. Right, exactly. Like we talked about, there's those things there as well as we talked about that could kill those um, sensitive organisms in the river. And a lot of that, too, is that the river is, you know, a cold water river, right? It's pretty cold because we talked about how that water comes from the bottom of Lake Lanier. But the cleaner the water and the colder, the um, higher level of like the dissolved oxygen you're going to have in that water. Mm-hmm. And that's actually what those sensitive fish like trout are using uh, to breathe. So your, your higher level of dissolved oxygen, the higher level of success for the trout. So that's why the water heats up certain fish could possibly die. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, that's wild. As a big pollutant, sedimentation never comes to mind, so it's really interesting that uh, that's a leading cause uh, of the impact of the river. You did mention that the river is actually cleaner than it's been in years? That's correct, that's correct. So a lot of work has been done over the years, you know, with various regulations like the Clean Water Act and, and things of that nature. There's also a lot of groups that do cleanups. You know, there's a lot of folks that are watching out like uh, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper that will look for possible sewage spills. Sewage is also what brings that E. coli level up that we monitor. And so those overflows that occur. But what's happened with the buildup of Atlanta over time is that the sewage, you know, we're producing more sewage, so more was going into the river, but now less and less is as 
it's being monitored and more infrastructure is built to handle that. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to hear that uh, the river's getting cleaner the more and more the years goes on. Because it is treated, you know, it's treated. And there's a regulation that says so much has to be maintained to be clean. Well, Mark, thanks for sharing with me and uh, uh, all of our audience uh, your information about the river. Really appreciate you. Sure thing. Thanks for having me out today. Thank you, Mark and Liam, for bringing this important topic to our attention. We're back in the forest with Scott now. So tell us, what's your favorite part of the forest? I'd have to say the trees. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'm one of those forest for the trees kind of guy. Okay, so we're out here woods washing mm. or forest bathing. Forest bathing. I was listening to the BBC World Service. There's a there's a tree. I think it's in Angola. Most of it is underground. The tree. Then, yeah. I mean wow. the, the woody part and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. And then during the wet season, it'll send some branches up through the soil to be pollinated and all that good stuff. But the bulk of it is below the surface. That's amazing. A dead tree that's still standing is called a snag. And what's a dead tree that's on the ground called? <laughs> a log. Uh, <laughs> yeah, logs come from trees. <laughs> so, they were standing. I just asked the kids, "Is that is that tree dead?" And they said, "Yeah." I was, yeah, well, it's full of life though, because we got all those decomposers and. Of course. Yeah. Even a log on the ground. Uh, is its own ecosystem. Yeah. A mini world of which we are only barely privy to. Yeah, it's always kind of humbling when you... Humbling. I, no, sometimes I like it's it. Humbling. Okay, what's your, what's your uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Uh, yeah, to, to, when you realize how much all these wonderful things going on all the time that we're oblivious to. And it's oblivious to us, too. So for a look at another world we love, our wildlife department's Jeremy Maniaponda is eager to tell us about a very special animal that lives in Georgia and serves a very special ecological purpose. Take it away, Jeremy. For this episode, we will be discussing another reptile species native to the state of Georgia. In contrast to our last case, the eastern box turtle, this reptile is probably unknown to many people as it is rarely if ever seen in the populated northern region of Georgia, despite having the distinction of being Georgia's official state reptile. Today we will talk about the scientifically named Gopherus polyphemus, or commonly named the gopher tortoise. We'll not only discuss the esteemed tortoise species, but also its incredibly important value to our native ecosystems. The gopher tortoise is the only species of tortoise native to Georgia. While there are other terrestrial turtles in Georgia, such as the aforementioned box turtle, the tortoises are entirely terrestrial. They do not venture into the water and have numerous adaptations for this lifestyle. They are found in the Georgia coastal plain region, extending north from the Florida border to a very interesting geologically defined region known as the Georgia Fall Line. This region is typically lower elevations, milder winters, and significantly different geologic makeup provides for a well-suited habitat for this tortoise and its interesting habits. A herbivorous species, it typically will graze on low-level plants including grasses, shrub leaves, cactus pads, and some fallen fruits amongst other plant material. Gopher tortoises get the majority of their water intake from this food material. They rarely will drink from standing waters. While gopher tortoise may be a phantom here to us in North Georgia, it is not necessarily such a rarity to humans living in its native range. Unfortunately, through human encroachment into tortoises' native ranges, interactions with humans is not uncommon at all. We'll discuss this a little more later in this episode. Gopher tortoises are a medium-sized species, typically grow to about 12 inches in length and about 10 pounds fully grown. They have a compact, boxy shell, a drab tan and brown uniform coloration, and large elephantine hind limbs and flattened shovel-like forelimbs with long, robust spade-like nails. They, like many tortoises species, live a very long time, sometimes having lifespans up to 90 years. With such long lives come some interesting life histories. For example, they will lay a modest-sized clutch of typically five to nine eggs with a very high mortality rate as hatchlings. It's estimated only 25% of the eggs will hatch in the wild, and only 10% of those hatchlings will survive to their first year. In addition, it may take them up to 10 years to reach sexual maturity. All of these life functions collide to make the gopher tortoises a very slow to reproduce species and very vulnerable. However, undoubtedly the most fascinating part of the gopher tortoise life history is how it gets its name. 
Just like their mammalian namesake, gopher tortoises dig long, elaborate tunnels and burrows. Due to their specialized appendages, they can dig burrows that are typically about 10 feet long and 6 feet deep with occasional side chambers and cavities. However, some burrows have been measured at over 40 feet long and 10 feet deep. The sandy, loose soil in the Georgia coastal plain is ideal for this specialized behavior. A gopher tortoise may spend 80% of its time in these burrows, escaping from the heat, the dangers of the weather, such as wildfires, predators, and other risks, coming out only occasionally to forage for food, bask, and breed. This exact behavior in life history is what makes the gopher tortoise such an incredibly valuable and indispensable part of the ecosystem. Gopher tortoises are what's known as a keystone species. A keystone species is a species that has a disproportionately large effect on the environment relative to its abundance. And in the event that gopher tortoises were removed, the ecosystems would change drastically and many other ecological niches that depend on them would suffer. These burrows that gopher tortoises and the gopher tortoises alone create provide homes for upwards of 350 different species. These include some very rare threatened and protected species such as the eastern indigo snake, the Florida mouse, the gopher frog, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, as well as hundreds of other mammals, reptiles, and invertebrates. Without these burrows, these species would succumb to natural stressors, such as drought, wildfires, and predation, making these burrows utterly critical for the species' survival. Just like many other species, the gopher tortoise's greatest threat is habitat loss, primarily through human land development. The preferred habitat which is the longleaf pine forest once covered 90 million acres unbroken from Virginia down to Florida and over to Texas. Less than 5% of the original longleaf pine forest remains today. As this native habitat has disappeared, the tortoises have become more prevalent in humanized areas and are subject to the unnatural risks associated with that, such as car strikes and poaching. In certain areas, dam creation to manage irrigation for agriculture has destroyed critical habitat for these tortoises. Fortunately, wildlife agencies have seemed to understand the importance of these species and the importance to the environment. Gopher tortoises are state protected throughout their U.S. range. Additionally, tortoises in Mississippi, Louisiana, and areas of Alabama are federally listed on the Endangered Species Act. This means that, by law, they may not be collected, harmed, harassed, or kept, even temporarily. Their burrows are even protected by law and cannot be disturbed. Commercial land developers work very closely with wildlife law enforcement to ensure that habitats are not unduly damaged. Here at Chattahoochee Nature Center, we do have the necessary licenses and permits in order to maintain them. We currently possess two gopher tortoise in our collection. Like all other animals in our collection, they are non-releasable and their stories are unfortunately a common story of likely uninformed harm. Both gopher tortoises were tended to us from suburban areas in metro Atlanta and an unnatural location for these tortoises. They were likely collected by residents who visited coastal Georgia or Florida and illegally brought them home as pets. Unfortunately, our geographic habitat here in the Piedmont Plain of Atlanta does not suit the desired habitat for gopher tortoises. In attempting to dig burrows in improper substrate or possibly hardened containers they were kept in, both tortoises damaged their nail beds on their forelimbs where the critical long nails grow, which in turn enables them to dig burrows. These permanent injuries disabled them from growing the digging nails and therefore they were deemed to be non-releasable. Please remember, wildlife is not free pets. Legal concerns aside, improper care, even inadvertently, can cause irreparable harm to these animals, as in these cases. As they have sustained such non-reversible injuries, they will live their life at Chattahoochee Nature Center and currently function as education animals. Our gopher tortoises live in a specialized pen in bright sunlight with a filtered shaded area and a sandy substrate with a buried underground barrier to prevent them from digging too far into their pen. They are fed numerous vegetables and commercially prepared zoological tortoise diets. They even love to snack on certain native plants such as hibiscus blossoms, which we grow right here on grounds. They are regularly used in interactive programs to help educate people on their peril. Unfortunately, we do not currently have an exhibit to show them to our visitors outside of these programs. However, this is a plan for which we hope to get visitor and public funding in order to exhibit these tortoises to all of our guests. Thank you, Jeremy. I do think it's great that the gopher tortoise was selected as Georgia State Reptile. Now, this is one of the things I like doing when you're out on the trail is, is rolling, if I find a big stone or a log, and I roll it to see what's happening underneath. 
Well, here's the log right it. here. Well, by George. Which way do we roll it? Do we pull it towards us or do we push it away from us? I say we're going to pull it towards us. Why? I don't want nothing popping out under yeah, there. Who knows who it might be under there? Might we Up into might my scare face. off. Let's well, see. now they're here. I was doing this with my granddaughter a year or so ago and had her roll the log back, and I don't know who was more surprised, her or the salamander. The salamander. <laughs> so, <clears throat> nice shelf. Yes. What I like about the, the rolling of the logs is kind of like peeling away a layer of dirt that yeah. we don't normally get to do. Yeah. All this fuzzy cobweb looking stuff is the is mycelium. mushroom mycelium, yeah. Mm -hmm. So rolling over logs is a cool way to get to see. That's right, but you rolled it the wrong way, the didn't you? Layer. Oh, well, shush. <laughs> they didn't know that. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell? I'm not afraid no, of anything. What about, there. <laughs> this yeah. looks like a rock that has not been disturbed for a while. It's, that's true. That's, uh, let's see if well, it's that looks like cement. That looks like it's part of a, a, a once building. Huh? <laughs> now, let's just leave it. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Anybody? That's a snail. I see roly poly. Yeah. Pill bug. Pill bugs. Yeah. Isopod. Isopod. Way too many names. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Not a lot going, of movement. Going once, going twice. That's an important thing that we must remember oh. when we roll a rock or a log. Put it back as best way we found it. Best right. way. We're trying to uh, we're trying to keep these uh, ecosystems mostly undisturbed. <laughs> Something can't go undisturbed when it's observed. So they found with light particles, they act differently when we're looking at them. Who knew that light particles were insecure? <laughs> that's disturbing. <laughs> Equally disturbing. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening to Your Place on the River, brought to you by Carriage Kia of Woodstock, Georgia, featuring Chattahoochee Nature Center, where our mission is to connect people with nature. Remember, to learn more at any time about Chattahoochee Nature Center and what's happening here, please visit chatnaturecenter.org. That's C-H-A-T-T -T, naturecenter.org. We also invite you to share any questions, suggestions, concerns, or compliments about our podcast. Compliments? I think that says complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Just tweet us on CNC Nature and use hashtag YPOTR. That's hashtag YPOTR. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group. All rights reserved.